You're listening to Errol Parker and Clancy Overall, editors of the Batuta Advocate on Desert Rock FM. Welcome back to the Batuta Advocate radio show, recording live here in the Diamantina Shire. We're on the home stretch to the holiday season, Christmas, Hanukkah, uh, whatever you celebrate around this time of the year, or nothing. Yeah. Or, or, or you could be a super edgy, what's that one they do at the pole from Seinfeld? Didn't, I never Festivus, watched Festivus. Oh. The festival for the rest of us. Really? Festivus. That's the atheist Christmas. I never got that show and why it's so popular. It's an acquired cultural taste, uh, New York comedy, I right believe. On. And it's actually interesting that we started with talking about the stand-up scene and, and American sitcoms because, you know, Australia has been cut off from the rest of the world for the last two years. We just received notification that 200,000 migrant visas and uh, foreign student visas will be allowed uh, almost immediately. That's good. Um, that's going to kickstart the economy, and that's all that matters in this country. Isn't yeah, it? that's that's and and you know, and it's and it's going to um, help the hospitality game, who have been relying on Australians for too long. And everyone of course, knows that skippies make the worst restaurant workers. Absolutely, we're too entitled. Too entitled. Hate uh, working. Fruit picking, of course. All of these industries that um, I, I didn't realize uh, was so dependent on open borders. And, of course, our universities. Who could forget the universities? The business models have changed know. rapidly. There's a few too many universities in this country. I know, but you know they've got the foreign student cash cow, which has been, I guess, something that the business models have come to rely on over the yeah. last decade. And that was a real shock to the system. This whole pandemic was a real shock to the system. And people, you come to learn, even with domestic borders closed, state to state, how much of the world we used to be able to see and and you know and how much we miss and today's i guess today's guest can kind of he's written a book that's going to take us back to you know when we could dart off you know just next door to some of our asian neighbors when we could mm. dart off to the barleys the borneos to lord how island lord how island norfolk island um, no, you don't want to be going there. Norfolk. That's, the hills have eyes in Norfolk. <laughs> they do. It freaks me They out. do. They're two heads and heaps of eyes. I've been there a couple of times. Yeah. It's fucking bad juju over there. Yeah, man. yeah. Terrible. But uh, today, today's guest, uh, I'm, I'm going to finish this introduction. It's a long-winded one. We live in a world today, uh, as I mentioned, we're very dependent. It's a globalized uh, economy, Australia, very dependent on open borders. And as we learnt during the you know, the citizenship crisis, one in four Australians are native-born to native-born parents. You know, once upon a time, our writers and our artists would romanticise places like Broken Hill or Hill End or Tasmania. But now we've kind of got like this post-national outlook on the world, particularly when it comes to arts. And we end up with people like Omar Musa. He can tell stories, authentic stories from his hometown of Queanbeyan and give us some great insight into how the world works there. And then again, he can take us to somewhere equally as foreign to, you know, to us as Batudans. You know, Omar, uh, Omar's hometown of Queanbeyan is equally as foreign as, you know, his father's land of Borneo. And I guess the new book, he's written about Queanbeyan uh, a few times now. He's published a few books about Queanbeyan, but this uh, this new book, Killer Nova, kind of talks about that particular part of the world I, I just mentioned, Borneo. Now, Omar, thank you for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Tell us what led to this this new book. I mean, released at the best time of the year, just in time to fill some stockings. Just in time for Festivus. Festivus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Annual Christian Give Giving Day. Yep. And, and of course, every other f- uh, holiday festival out there. What inspired this book and how did you get there? Man, it came completely out of nowhere. Hey, I was back in Borneo a few years ago. I'd got to this point in my life where I was like really sick of writing and mm-hmm. performing. I'd come to hate the thing that I was supposed to love. And I was just traveling around, you know, I took the public ferry up from the east coast of um, Indonesian Borneo, a place called Samarinda, mm-hmm. and just slept on the public ferry, floated up um, to the middle of the jungle. Mm-hmm. I just would hang out in longhouses. I'd sometimes walk into the jungle just wherever the road took me and then ask the local village headman if I could sleep in the in the longhouse. And, and yeah, I sort of came to realize, like, as I was you know, chatting to these strangers who are still so familiar to me, getting in touch with my homeland again, that I needed a new form to express myself with. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what that was going to be, but I I thought it wasn't going to be to do with performing or words. And and a couple of weeks later, I was back visiting my father in Malaysian Borneo, and and I I attended a a woodcut workshop by this guy called Eric Lost Control, 
which is uh, yeah, it's <laughs> that's not his, it. It's that's not his. It's not his government name. No, no, lost no. control. Lost yeah, control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His real name is Eric Tan, but he's <laughs> um, he's from my dad's hometown, Sandakan, and and this yeah. guy's an activist. He's a he's a woodcutter. He's a punk rocker, and he. Uh, I, I just said, hey man, I'm probably going to be really shit at this, and sorry I'm late, but do you reckon I can have a go? And so he taught me. He he sat me down, taught me how to carve the wood, roll it with ink, press it into cloth or paper. And yeah, I found this new new art form to express yeah. myself with, woodcut prints. And so I started combining the the images, the visual art with poetry and with little little silly stories and scraps mm-hmm. from history. And yeah, and that's and that's the origin stories of how I came up with this weird book that you're holding over there. That's a combo of art and poems. I mean, big fan uh, since since I was a young man of the old lino print, the Australian, I guess, uh, the uh, appropriation, the, the Australian the, appropriation, the, a bit of lino, a bit of vinyl, s- yep. just you know, some more artistic theft. You know, it's been going on for thousands of years. But, you know, that, that's what we would have been taught and everyone would have cut themselves up as young kids in art class with those blades. What are you working with here? What is the, it, this medium? It's a print, but what are we working with? Yeah, so that's interesting. It's it's um, it's not expensive rosewood or cherry wood or yeah. anything like the old Japanese masters used. The, the guys in Borneo use um, MDF, you know, cheap compressed <laughs> sawdust pretty much. Yeah. It's like an off cut of the, of the logging industry and, yeah. and that's what makes it sort of interesting and, and sort of complicated, I guess, yeah. because, you know, I'm talking a lot in the book about the, the logging industry that's destroying my homeland and deforestation, yeah. but then I'm carving wood. <laughs> yeah. That's that's an offcut yeah, of that yeah. industry. So yeah. it makes me kind of kind of complicit in yeah. some weird way. So I'm, complicity is something that I explore a lot. Well, you know, book. DiCaprio gets private jets, so you can't really criticize the yeah. man's platform, can you? If the platform is spreading the word that is much louder, you know, than the, than the wood it's cut on. Can you tell us a little bit about how much you knew about where, I guess it's your homeland, I said your father's land earlier, it's your homeland too. Tell us a little bit about how much you knew of that growing up. I mean, you know. Of, of Borneo? Or yeah, yeah, of just of, of just all this. I mean, you obviously explored and seen a lot, you know, that's all, all covered in Kilanova. But, you know, you, as we said earlier, on the New South Wales side of Canberra's outskirts, was this always something that was kind of hovering around? Yeah, yeah. I was always deeply connected to my mm-hmm. culture. Yep. Uh, my mum is white Australian. Yep. She's Irish Australian from Forbes, Western New South Wales. Um, but shout she, out to Forbes. Had a flood shout last out to Forbes. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, actually, flood times, the uh, the Gordon Duff Bridge that was built to, to help Forbes during during flood times, Gordon Duff was my grandpa. Okay. So there's a little tidbit no one knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very um, Irish Australian name, no one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, but but my mum, even though she's Aussie, she 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 speaks fluent Bahasa Malaysia and Bahasa Indonesia. She right. she learned mm-hmm. it, and and so growing up, you know, my parents really encouraged me to stay connected through the language, uh, and also obviously through the food. You yeah. know, at the time in the eighties, there was only two two Asian supermarkets in uh, in Canberra, as far as I can remember, like one in Dixon. One in Mawson, mm-hmm. and um, and so you know, getting some char kway teow or making a laksa or a rendang uh, every couple of weeks on payday that was like a special way of me connecting with with my culture. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like the nuances of it. Obviously, as a kid, you don't understand them. You know, I thought I was just a Malay kid, but once you start going back to Borneo and you understand the the intricacies of the race relations in a place like Malaysia, you yeah. start to be able to break your identity down a little yeah. bit and realize that. You know, somewhere like Borneo, there's 45 different tribes, mm, and yeah. um, a lot of them now define themselves as Malay, but it's yeah. actually a bit more complicated than that. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. just when you look at Malaysian Australians in themselves, um, we can see that, you know, the, the different faiths and different backgrounds, different colours, mm-hmm. you know. We've got, I mean, obviously, Kamal. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. And then... and then Abdul you know, Abdullah. Abdul Abdullah, former friend of the show, guest, former guest friend of the show. Uh, Guy Sebastian. Guy Sebastian and uh, Kyrgios, you know. Kyrgios. King, the king. Penny Wong. Yeah. Ho, Adam. So yeah, me and Abdul have talked about this and, and I'm we've come to the realization sorry, I've come to the realization <laughs> and the decision that I am the seventh most famous Malaysian Australian. Okay. And uh, Abdul's the eighth. So okay. I think it's yeah. You know, it's 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 pretty high stakes Until the sort he of wins game that we're playing. <laughs> What's that? Until he wins an Archibald. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, know, you might hold him off with this new book for a little <laughs> while. Too. Me, but he'll never leap Rob Kamal. So, you know. No one can. <laughs> Kamal, yeah, no, no. Um, uh, well, it, there's often, there's actually a very strong kind of bond that intertwines Australian history and Malaysian history in your father's hometown of Sanakan. In the Second World War, you know, that was that, that was a big prisoner of war camp. When 
students, uh, you know, you, you know, were learning about this in school. How was that interpreted from your end? You know, like this has always been a place that's been so familiar to you. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. That's the first time someone's asked me that, actually. Yeah, Sandakan, you know, it was a place where the, with the yeah, the death camp, and uh, and that was really close to to my grandma's village and i knew a lot about it but i think one of the sad things is that the the local presence is often forgotten about you know yeah. like because there are a lot of dayak people indigenous people who helped out the the yeah. allies yeah but then those same allied forces that uh, get so lionized and spoken yeah. about in history from the australian perspective they also you know they did bomb local towns to bits so yeah. it was actually like a lot of local people suffered as well, but mm. they're forgotten about yeah, in yeah. this grand mythology of yeah, our yeah. World of War II history. Of the Allied forces, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, as tragic as it was, obviously. Yeah. But yeah, I was sort of aware of that special connection that Australia and Borneo had, um, because also a lot of the um, headhunting tribes, you know, they would, mm. they reignited that practice in World War Two, and, yeah. and and if uh, there were soldiers that went off the tra- Japanese soldiers went off the track, they were, yeah. they they found um, you know Japanese. Uh, heads from world war Two up in the up in the eaves of longhouses in the jungle you know really um yes yeah, so it's pretty pretty <laughs> full on yeah. but um <laughs> they were not expecting that, that were they? Yeah, they that. Expecting that i mean out. you've got the americans with you know <laughs> with uh, like unmatched superiority you got you know australians going through the forest with flame throwers and the locals you know are out to get you too i mean yeah, that yeah. Been fucking hell yeah, yeah it's yeah. funny i mean look Old habits die hard, you yeah, know, yeah, because yeah. I was uh, even, <laughs> even, you know, I was telling you about that, that trip taking the public ferry up the river. Yeah. yeah. When I got to the end, I was chatting to some local blokes and they go, oh, look, you know, yeah, that head hunting, we don't, we don't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. And they go, well, well, look, if someone's really bad, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all we right. We don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not condoned. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about Borneo as an island? Like, you know, some people would... I mean, Brunei, you got them in the mix too. Yeah, you know, yeah. you've got you've got a lot going on. Not just um, the multi-ethnic, uh, multicultural aspect of the, the of each community you walk into, but you've also got borders everywhere. Yeah. When were these all drawn up, and was there ever a time where Borneo was one? Well, I mean, look, I'm not a I'm not a historian. I mean, mm. I think um, it was occupied by by a lot of different powers over the years. Yeah. You know, the Dutch had a section of it, the British had a section of it. There was a time when, in the 1800s, when a rogue um, American trader actually got the rights to North Borneo for a while, for about a year. <laughs> uh, the Spanish were trying to to control it for a while. The Italians talked about making North Borneo a penal colony, and then, of course, the, the Philippines and the, and the Sultanate of yeah. the Southern Philippines have still, I think, sometimes makes a claim yeah, right. on Borneo. And so the the two Malaysian Borneo states, Sabah and Sarawak, they had a few different options, I think, in the 1960s, if I'm not mistaken, you know, about being autonomous, going with the state of Malaysia, going with the Philippines, or going with Indonesia. So when you talk about these melting, shifting borders, I yeah, mean, yeah. that's that's a case <laughs> in modern history yeah. where, you know, one political decision, it sort of changes the future yeah. of a place forever. And, um, and in some ways, you know, Borneo has been raped and pillaged for its resources mm. um, by mainland Malaysia um, for, for so long that there are people, and I don't think I really have a right to comment on this, but there are people who think it would have been better to go the route of somewhere like Singapore and, yeah. beca- and have autonomy. You know? yeah. yeah. But it's probably, yeah, like I say, I'm not a historian I, and, and I'm not a, I, did, I wasn't born and raised there. So yeah. sometimes these things are difficult because yeah. I do feel like I want to be and I am part of the conversation mm. in a lot of ways now, being mm. connected with the art scene over there. But then, you know, yeah. you, you got to know your lane as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah you've got to, you've got to. Have, uh, I mean, it's it's hard to ever know who had the most charisma, who was leading the conversations, who was, you know. There's a lot of, and I'm sure there's a lot of history that wasn't documented about how those decisions were made. Um, oh, 100 yeah. percent. This is a crazy thing to bring up, but I bring it up in the book. There are a lot of people who say that when Borneo became a part of the Malaysian Federation. Um, the government actually burned a whole lot of books that were to do with indigenous culture and language, yep. you know, actively had mm. book burnings, mm. you know what I mean? And and even if that f- didn't happen historically, the government banned speaking indigenous languages yeah. on television, on radio, and the teaching of it in schools. Yep. So even post the British, when the state of Malaysia came in, it was almost like a new form of colonization yep. also yeah. occurred. You know, so it's uh, yeah, it's it's interesting stuff, man. But um, uh, but you know, the, the, these, cultures these cultures survive. These cultures survive. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, there's still 
A lot of debates around it, though, because yep. it's tricky. You yep. know, the, the, the government um, is uh, always on a land grab and a cash grab. and, and a fair um, bit and of revisionism in there, I imagine. A lot of revisionism and people, you know, getting screwed over by the bottom dollar, you know, yep. the, yeah. the big dollar, uh, especially in regarding resources like yeah. like logging, oil, gas, yep. all that sort of stuff. And rubber. Rubber, there, yeah. yep, that was yep. a big one. Yeah, so, you know, even something like that has resonance because, like, the, the the government put in this thing where they made palm oil plantations and and they hired all of the ru- rural poor gave them plots of land yeah. gave them a house to live in uh, and so most of my family on the east coast um, were laborers on the palm oil plantation yeah. and now in the west yeah. you know we we might demonize people who are yeah. part of the palm oil but what were the people in the 1970s going to do when yeah. they when they're poor laborers mm. and they're offered a plot of land and a house you yeah. know uh, these things are tricky. It helped modernise Malaysia while also destroying it. Yeah. Like, like, like the coal industry in Queensland, <laughs> mate. Yeah. It's, like, it's like you're going to upset a lot of people in Melbourne. You know? yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny here, because obviously I'm not, I'm not pro palm oil, but yeah. then yeah. like when you talk to a poor, a poor person on the East Coast, mm. they go, yeah, well, look, the Westerners are always going on about these monkeys in trees, but what about us? We can't feed our kids. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. so these things are never, never simple, are they? Yeah, I want to go back, scooch back a little bit to you know when you first kind of popped up on the uh, on the literary scene. What was the trigger for you to get your first writers' festival inv- invitation? Because you've written a lot of stuff, you've written a few books, but you've done you've done a lot of stuff. You've done poetry, you know, you've done a lot of essay writing, and of course you're, you're a published author. You know, both kind of semi autobiographical like this one, and and you've dabbled in all kinds of stuff. You've dabbled in full blown fiction. Yeah, yeah. Well. Um I think it was 2007 or 2008. I got the worst. I got the worst memory. But I won the Australian Poetry Slam at the Sydney Opera House, okay. and, the, and the prize for it was five thousand dollars cash. Part of the prize was going to the Ubud Readers and Writers Festival in Bali, oh, and right. um, and that was my first time going to a writers festival and interacting with novelists and playwrights. So that was your first. You hadn't really even done the Sydney Melbourne. No, Canberra no, thing. I don't think I had. So that um, kind of goes back to this, you know, this new wave of kind of like, you know, Australia as a, you know, a part of Asia. Yeah. And, and the fact that you know, the bloke who's just won the uh, Poetry Slam at the Sydney Opera House first writers festivals in Indonesia. Yeah, totally. And I hadn't even I hadn't published a, a book then yeah. either. Uh, I was I was a performer. You know, I yeah. was coming out of the hip hop scene. You know, basically it was 50-50 uh, doing rap shows and, and poetry shows, mm. even though I was sort of trying to melt the borders between those as well. And so, yeah, I went over and then I realized, oh, shit, maybe I should have something to, to give to people if yeah. I meet people because yeah. I wanted to do this as a career, yeah. you know. And so I printed up at the at this place, oh, I forget what it was called, but it was behind the Luxor shop in Dixon in Canberra. Yeah. And I printed up some some little poetry books and it was this thing called The Clocks. I got my, my mate Cole Bennett, who's still my collaborator to this day, to help me design it. Mm-hmm. And then I just started giving it to all these different authors and poets and, and slowly starting to build a build a following for myself and build a career, like doing taking advantage yeah. of social media you know i realized that that was a tool yeah. at my disposal facebook youtube you know myspace back then yeah, yeah, i was yeah. even using that yeah 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 <laughs> and, um, <laughs> your profile song yeah yeah my top eight friends <laughs> <laughs> and uh and yeah so i slowly started building from there but i pretty much came out of performance into the writing side of it and then tell me a little bit about your semi-biographical stuff about queen Bean and 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 how it was writing that because that's very different to you know what we're talking about falling asleep on ferries in borneo yeah. you know this is more falling asleep at train stations in the outskirts of canberra yeah well, <laughs> <laughs> the, the uh, one of the iconic brutalist circular bus stops of canberra <laughs> <laughs> I, um, yeah look i've always been really proud of being from from queanbeyan new south wales you know when i was growing up in canberra everyone paid me out they called Queanbeyan struggle town. They say that it's the town that was dug and not built. Even now, they make jokes about Queanbeyan. That's a pretty um, good sledge. The town that was dug and not built. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, I was always really proud of being from there because I thought that it was like it was a real place. Like mm-hmm. it had a soul. It was yep. this this interesting mix of um, multicultural elements. It was a bit rougher. You know, yeah. it's definitely changed now. It's gentrified yeah. a little yeah. bit. 
But I always had this idea as I got into writing that Queanbeyan was a microcosm for Australia. It's yeah. a little bit, a little bit like Batuta, yeah, you know? Yeah. yeah. Case it's, study. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and, um, you know, because it was sort of, even the, the motto of Queanbeyan is um, city living, country benefits. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. So, <laughs> so it's this. So you skip town quick. <laughs> yeah, it's this, this mix of, of rural and urban. It's got all these different multicultural elements. Um, and so I was always trying to kind of raise a place like that that yeah. people would shit on and, yeah. and make fun of but raise that <laughs> yeah. to the level of, of myth yeah, like yeah. like you know it's it's not like that coastal idyll or yeah. you, you know it's not like yeah. the outback yeah it's kind of rough suburbia yeah yeah, you know? yeah and i wanted in my own narrative to raise that to the level mm. of myth and i thought that would be out of metro yeah What's that? Yeah, out of metro. metro yeah. yeah, out of metro. Exactly. But it, it, it's an interesting thing to have, you know, running alongside Canberra. Queenbeard's an interesting place because Canberra, it's multicultural, but we're talking a different kind of multiculturalism there. We're talking diplomats and, you know, and, and, and yeah. public servants, people that probably aren't even, you know, a lot a lot of families are raised there, you know, from different migrant families. But And Canberra's a bit creepy. Yeah, yeah. Canberra. Like, it's, it's, it's all planned. Yeah, a bit of Truman then, Show. And then, but, like, <laughs> you can see the parts that were planned and then, you know, the town... Planners like fuck. All right, let, let's put on an, another big suburb here. We'll, yeah. we'll call it yeah. Garland, right? And, and then we'll go Early on. Like, tack, had nothing tack, to do with But then you've got the actual, I guess, the working class, the workers that would come into Canberra would be based out of Queanbeyan, New South Wales side of the border. Yeah. So you've also got, you know, the uh, interstate benefits as well. Yeah. Uh, you have the benefits of being a state. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you don't have to rely on the uh, territory government to pick up your rubbish. But, you know, it's a bit more authentic than you do, you know. You well, yeah, that. yeah. I mean, I, I, I do have love for Canberra. Now, I used to make this distinction, but it's like, oh, come on, look. You know, Queen yeah. and Canberra, inextricably linked. We're yeah. like the the older, smaller, rowdier brother, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. You're like what Delaware away. is to Washington, D.C. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's an interesting place because I heard that, like, early on when Canberra was created, mm. Queenbean had already been around for, like, oh, 100 years. Hun- yeah, yeah. 100 and there years. was there was the, a, a railway line. That's why mm. they. That's part of the reason they built Canberra there. But Canberra was teetotaling. You couldn't. You couldn't drink really? in Canberra, I, I believe, yeah. And, but I think in, you're but right, But people yeah. would have to go across to Queanbeyan yeah. and, and, and get wasted, you know. Yeah, right. So I think that's where some of that some of that started, that whole idea that it was a bit, you know, a bit rougher and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I think it's – the other thing that I often forget to say is that it is a really beautiful place naturally, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. that's one thing I've sort of really come to realise, especially during COVID, because we're fo- forced to look locally. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just – instead of, like, going abroad, I'd be just, like, wandering these same streets that yeah. I've been wandering for years and years, going on yeah. bushwalks and being like, man, I was so lucky to grow up here. It's just beautiful. Tell us a little bit about the demographics of um, Queen Bee. You know, we were just – spoken about Borneo, um, you know, and, and that was, you know, oh. a multicultural kind of melting pot, melted borders. Yeah. Uh, but Queenbee and and, and, you, and, you, and I guess you covered a lot of this in your book, 2013, Here Come the Dogs. Tell us a little bit about the different cultures you grew up alongside and how they informed your writing around that time. Anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's a good question, you know, because your own personal story of it yeah. is probably quite different to yeah. the actual official demographics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I remember recently looking at the um, the demographics of Queanbeyan and it is actually quite overwhelmingly Anglo still, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is weird because yeah. I always had the idea that I grew up around so many different cultures and yeah. I don't know if that was just because I grew up in a flat block. Yeah, yeah. So there was like, you know, there was us, there was a Malaysian family, there was Koreans, there was a lot of um, Islanders, there was yeah. a lot of people from the Balkans. Yeah. So the way I remember it is that I grew up all around Islanders yeah. and and people from Macedonia, yeah. Serbia, Croatia, stuff like that, a lot of Indigenous people as well. Mm. But, yeah, officially it's probably, probably quite different to yeah. that. But it informed me in heaps of different ways, I think. Yeah. I mean, firstly, just in a personal way, we all used to like just congregating on the stairs of the flats and just telling yarns from our different parts of the world. Well, yeah. sorry, our parents did, yeah, yeah. you know, and so mm. we soaked in this love of, of storytelling. And I even, I, I used to like, there was this one guy who was always telling tall tales and, and I quite liked the fact that I knew that they were made up, you mm. know, and <laughs> like I knew that it didn't actually happen, but yeah. they were still really, they were even better because yeah. of that. And the As, second time it comes out, yeah, it's even bigger. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And you go, oh, did I say that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but um, no, there, there was that. But then there was also this idea that we were all from different backgrounds, but we were trying to forge a community, yeah. um, you know, from fracture in a yeah. way. Like mm-hmm. there were a lot of people 
um, coming after the wars in the Balkans and, and stuff like that. And then I used to think it was just this like really particular kind of weird mix of people. I was like, where else in the world would you have a group of friends like the one I described in, yeah. in Here Come yeah. the Dogs where there's one guy who's Macedonian and, and one guy who's Samoan, but yeah. they're finding all these commonalities yeah, through yeah. their various religious backgrounds and all this yeah, sort yeah. of stuff. And so, yeah, it's, I think it's also given me this chip on my shoulder. You know, mm-hmm. I, I wasn't from Sydney. I wasn't from... Melbourne. I wasn't from what was perceived as the epicenter of Australian culture. You weren't even from Canberra, really. Wasn't even from Canberra, exactly. (laughs) And so, although I I kind of grew up pretty privileged in certain ways, like you know, I came from an artistic family. Like my mum was a journo. Yeah. But then growing up where I did, yeah, in the flats in Queanbeyan, I kind of, um, yeah, I don't know. I got this chip on my shoulder, and I also learned that I I wanted to celebrate kind of the outsider i guess and it gave me a particular view on society that you couldn't get if you were right at the epicenter yeah if you were part of the sydney push yeah (laughs) exactly (laughs) and tell us a little bit about here come the dogs for those in the track that haven't uh you know read your stuff and and certainly haven't seen your 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 block paintings tell us about here come the dogs and and just how biographical is it oh man here come the dogs it feels like a lifetime ago that i wrote it i Mm. think it came out in 2013 2014 it's about um three friends uh, all of different ethnic backgrounds growing up in a small unnamed town on the edge of a larger (laughs) unnamed city (laughs) and um and then yeah one of them becomes a masturbating arsonist so Yeah. yeah it's a pretty wild crazy book a lot of it about hip-hop culture um low-level crime drug mm-hmm. dealing um g- graffiti race relations mm-hmm. anger powerlessness masculinity mm-hmm. yeah look i i don't like to go backwards with my artistic practice so i haven't read it or looked at it in years yeah but i think i've you know it's it's always interesting to hear people now saying that it resonated with them because for me it makes me a bit uncomfortable it mm-hmm. was like a different me that made it it's yeah. really dark it's really angry mm-hmm. you know what i mean it's it's almost verging on nihilism like on, your, on your young man shit it's i was on my young man shit <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah um and and i sort of so it makes me um it makes me a bit uncomfortable sometimes looking yeah. back at it but i think also maybe that's why it resonated with mm. a lot of people because it was yeah. really raw yeah like me nowadays i couldn't I, I don't think i could write a book like that yeah 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 <laughs> You're a bit too optimistic. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. Like, what's... Yeah, I mean, I just remember, like, the morass I was in at the time yeah. of, like, yeah. mental health problems yeah. and addiction and all sorts yeah. of stuff. And you've know seen... I mean? And now you've seen the... Um... I mean, I mean, it's not. It's you, you've found you've seen the beauty and all that in, in your art and, and in the island as well. Yeah. But you know, in, in between that, 2013 to now, and we obviously spoke to uh, Abdul Abdullah about this not long ago. But you, you know, and and well before 2013. But you know, between 2013 and now, we saw a lot of stuff happening in the world that would have politicised your existence much more than it already had been. Abdul spoke to this. Abdul. Abdullah, you know, the artist, eighth famous Malaysian Australian, talks about that 2001, just that moment when his family went from the eccentric people down the street who dressed, uh, you know, eccentric. And they could all fight. And we didn't, (laughs) they could all fight, but, you know, we didn't know much about them to, you know, what Muslims and and what that became uh, in the eyes of the Australian, you know, media, political class, schoolyards, you know, everything, when the towers came down. Since 2013, it's ramped up even more. You know, mm-hmm. we almost saw a prime minister, I guess you could say, ousted just because of how those pot buttons he was pressing yep. in the shape of Tony Abbott. How did that inform where you ended up? You know, 2013, the rise of ISIS, the laws, the terrorism laws, the all of the stuff that's been, you know, happened uh, since then. And it seems like COVID's really pushed a lot of this stuff out of the news cycle. But that was definitely what people were using leading into elections. You yeah. know, Islam, the fear, the, the, the fear of the great unknown in... Yep. in you know, people within our community were feeling that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I'm not alone in saying this, but the the shadow of 9-11 sort of hangs over my whole life and my mm-hmm. whole political identity. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, you do go from being kind of the eccentric uh, ethnic family or yeah. ethnic kid who has still definitely experiences racism and everything, but in a more kind of nebulous, vague way. Yeah, yeah. And then suddenly, when you're watching the television, you realise, like, oh, my God, I am the enemy of the state. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and then the Cronulla riots comes around and it's um and the sure, sword some sh- rather formative years for yourself yeah, yeah. and the, and the and the and the sword sharpens yeah. even more you know what i mean and yeah. it feels like the blade's been sharpening ever since yeah. and something like 
the Christchurch massacre, yep. that tragic event, is where we see that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, you know, I think it's unhealthy to to think of that event as just some rogue, crazed madman. Mm. I do feel it's like the Pressure sharp cooker. end mm. of that blade, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's the product mm. of, of all of this dog whistling, all of this demonizing yeah. of an entire community. And so did that make me more angry, more fierce yeah. to try and stand taller as well? Yeah, probably did. Yeah. But it also, no matter how strong you are, mm. it can't help but also erode you yeah, at yeah. the same time, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, you, 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 you know, you're taking knocks. Was your writing being affected by all that, you know, in that news cycle? Or were you, were you finding inspiration, you know, probably unwanted inspiration? Well, yeah. I mean, there, there is a, a poem in the book that I'm very proud of that's yeah. um, about visiting the, 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 the mosque where the Christchurch massacre occurred and my complicated relationship mm -hmm. with Islam, yeah. you know, um, because I do have a, a complex, nuanced relationship with it. I was raised very religious, yeah. um, but I'm not super religious now. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, people have always tried to push me into a box of yeah. their creation, yeah, yeah, yeah. whether it's racist right-wingers yeah. demonizing you or it's well-meaning lefties yeah. trying to make you some spokesperson. Like, we'd, love you on, we'd love you on the panel, Omar. E exactly. <laughs> well, exactly. Like, I remember, um, you know, when I, when I was on q and I remember someone we on Twitter. We can't pay you. <laughs> yeah, 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 we can't pay you. But we'll, we'd love yeah. your lens. Yeah. yeah I, I remember I was on Q&A years and years ago and someone on Twitter said, oh, my God, this could be the new hot young face of moderate Islam in Australia. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was like, man, I'm not even sure I'm young, hot or moderate. Like, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's a fucking roller coaster of a tweet, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, it's wild. It's just jumping all over the place. But like, And she means well, but you know, it's, just, it's just not it. And that's definitely a box you've been put in there. Well, yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying, you know. Like yeah. they think they're uplifting you by putting you in this box, but actually it's diminishing you. Mm. And yeah. so I've fought against that for years and so I kind of purposefully actually didn't write a lot about my Muslim identity and kept that very personal yeah. um, because I I didn't want to be forced into that, into yeah. being some spokesperson or poster boy, mm -hmm. especially because of some of the issues I've had. I, I, I sort of, um, yeah, I found, it, I found it tricky, you know. There yeah. were times I felt like a hypocrite when, when, you know, I was clearly a Muslim Australian but then I was being very open about like alcohol and drug use, yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that, you know. It made me feel like a hypocrite. Yeah, yeah. But as the years have gone on and I think I've settled into um, – yeah, you know, being comfortable with with those paradoxical elements, yeah. I've, I've, I'm also comfortable kind of talking about them, yeah, and I, yeah. I discuss them a lot more in this new book. Yeah, it is it is interesting. Uh, I, I would have to say for for Muslim Australians and and you know, as someone with a story like yours, growing up around all different cultures, living a life that you said you you feel contradictions every day, feel it in your public profile because it, it's only taken you know in the last. Um, in, in terms of Australian, you know, the, the history of Christianity in Australia, terms like lapsed Catholic or recovering Catholic, you know, people have only just gotten comfortable saying that from like a, you know, a, a, a kind of spiritual end in, in Australia. And this is people that have been, you know, feeling that guilt for 200 years. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it, it, it's, it's a whole nother thing what you're talking about. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and it brings me to my next question. How, did you, how do you feel that Islam is viewed, you know, back in Borneo? Because it's obviously not the only religion. Right. No, it's not. But, yeah. okay, this is really interesting stuff. Mm. And so, you know, we live in a country where I would say that Islam is demonized. Yeah. But Malaysia is a place where Islam is weaponized. Yeah, right. And so it's quite weird for me mm. to have yeah. those, to have that identity and then to cross the border into the homeland and suddenly it's flipped. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I think Abdul's found that as well. Like mm. he was trying to talk in Indonesia when we were traveling around there about Islamophobia and to an audience of progressive people who were a bit confused because what they were worried about was the rise of the hard line and kind of fundamentalism and yeah. this really prescriptive form of Islam yeah. that's the sort of Wahhabi style thing yeah. that is now sort of pervading Indonesia so and Malaysia. They do have like an absolute, like they actually do have a phobia, yeah, you know, of of a certain type of Islam. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, and so, it's kind that of is, this. That is com very tricky. It's really tricky, right? It's a yeah. completely flipped and reversed conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's all about power, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And so, when religion allies with power in mm. a system like that that they've got over there, mm. it's obviously a very dangerous thing. But then, when 
power uh, it sort of asserts itself yeah. against people of a minority, um, you know, and, and pushes them down, then yeah. it becomes a whole different power dynamic. And so, yeah, like the, these th- are things I've only started to really explore and try to understand in mm. like the last, you know, five years or something. Um, and obviously, I'll never understand them. I'm not a political scientist. I'm yeah. not an anthropologist, but yeah. I try to explore them through my poetry. Yeah. And, and so getting a novel out, a memoir out, that's a certain that's a taxing process you know you can be depleted in many ways i'm I'm guessing i'm guessing we've never really done it but how does that compare finishing a full you know here come the dogs you know full-blown story compared to what you've done here where you're kind of putting yourself on the page but in a much different way with Mm. the block paintings paired with poetry how does the process feel and what's the difference well there's a huge difference yeah between those two particular projects because this sort of came out of nowhere, and mm-hmm. it came from a much more joyful and playful place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was unexpected. I, I never thought I'd be working in the visual arts, never. Yeah. Yeah. And so I tried to keep it kind of sacred in yeah. that way and just to have fun with it and yeah. carve whatever I felt. I mean, obviously, the book still deals with some of those darker issues, mm-hmm. but I would say that it's um, it's from a more joyful place. Mm-hmm. Whereas Here Come the Dogs, I used to have this kind of view of art that it was a matter of life and death and that I was willing to sacrifice everything. I was willing to sacrifice my mental health, mm-hmm. my liver, yeah. my life yeah. for the art. And Your I rest. did it. What's that? <laughs> Your rest. My rest, exactly. Yeah. And and I and four years it took me to create Here Come the Dogs of, yeah. of almost pushing myself into Red madness. Line. Yeah, yeah. The darkest places. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that was what it took to make good art. Yeah, yeah. Whereas yeah. with this, I'm sort of trying to assert myself against that mythology and yeah. subvert it and question it mm. and say, no, is that maybe that's a big lie that we've been taught? Yeah. Uh, that you that you have to suffer as an artist to yeah. create the good art. I mean, yeah. we can talk about the dark issues, mm-hmm. but maybe do it in a playful way. Yeah. In a play that uh, in a way that's a bit more ecstatic or euphoric. Yeah. How do you feel now, having done this? What you over ten years writing. And just you know, in various disciplines of artistry, what has shattered C- things certainly must have in in the way you just said. Then you thought you had to kind of be this hard living hedonist, and you know, like kind of you know, just emotional vandal, you know, on yourself. Yeah. And w- was that? I mean, and you can be honest here. Like, w- was that informed by kind of romanticized ideas of the great red wine swilling writers out there, or or was that kind of something you picked up on the journey? through the Australian literary scene because, you know, a lot of people, and you meet you meet artists who, you know, people like to envision them, painters particularly, people like to envision them as, you know, just pissed all the time and just so eccentric and out there. And and, and a lot of them will tell you, man, have you ever tried to paint drunk? It's, yeah. it's incredibly yeah, yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah. Like Jimi well, Hendrix was much better sober. Than, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, not, that's <laughs> yeah. so funny you say that. I remember a hip-hop producer telling me that uh, years and years ago when I was recording an album in Seattle and he goes, yeah, do you know when Jimi Hendrix was at his best when he was sober and clean? <laughs> and it's a good quote, but I actually do wonder, was he? Like, was he ever? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. When, when did you see him? Man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, no, I'm not sure. Sure, if I picked that up through osmosis somehow, yeah. through yeah. all the you know the Hemingways and the Bukowskis, yeah. although I was never like really a Bukowski fan, yeah. but I think it was that idea potentially, um, you know, maybe some subconscious thing in the early days of that that I was going against the stereotypes of Australia, but maybe there was some weird part of me that was trying to fit in as well by yeah. saying like you know oh yeah okay I'm an outsider in these ways, but I'm also still you know a hard yeah. drinker and a larrikin yeah. and all yeah. this sort of stuff. Oh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm Lawson out there in Burke just drinking bottles of rum, you know. <laughs> yeah, because even when we're sort of going against the mainstream, I think you're still conditioned by it in certain yeah. ways that yeah. you don't understand. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And um, and yeah, like uh, I'm not sure. Uh, well, I think because these issues take you to such a such a dark place it becomes basically a matter of life and death mm-hmm. uh, whether you give in to them or whether you try and turn your life around and so it was a moment of necessity for me mm-hmm. if i wanted to keep living that i'd have to learn to create art from a different place as well as mm-hmm. live life yeah. differently yeah you know so yeah it's a hard question i don't think i've ever been asked that or, or answered it before but um yeah i'm gonna think about it all we know is during the lockdown you were bushwalking yeah, yeah, bushwalking, <laughs> which is a good way of uh, gardening. Yeah, it's a good a, a good insight into into where you're at now as an artist because uh, you know 
here comes the dog era. Could have been a couple of bottles of monkey brain and uh, <laughs> sitting in front of a typewriter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even that, the right, right drunk, edit sober, it's just yeah. so ridiculous that everybody <laughs> thinks that. Like, imagine, think about how much shit poetry and or fiction like, has come out of that, or out just, of that principle. <laughs> or just imagine, like, 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 sure, you'd be able to do it for one day. Yeah. But then when you get up in the morning and have to do it again, you know, there is just nothing inside your brain after a big day it's just just a bunch of pigeons yeah yeah flying into windows covered yeah, yeah. you know or the homer simpson like the, 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 the turtle playing the violin yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> said. yeah all right let's do it again it's yeah. Like, yeah it's like no it's, a, it's for good reason that everyone loathes the second day of a big trip you know what i yeah. mean it's like you know you're going overseas you pull into um you know, sometimes it'll you get the like, first night fever. Yeah, first night fever. You kind of got to transfer, and you spend a night in Singapore, and you, <laughs> you know, you're not even looking forward to your holiday after that. You know, let alone writing every day and taking a knock. And everyone knows a real holiday is one where you're kind of really relaxing. You're not, yeah, you're, yeah. you're not living that way. So it would have been, it would be, it'd be very difficult to um, to get more than two good. Good nights of drunken writing. <laughs> yeah, well, well, exactly. I mean, what you said before, you're, re- you're redlining the whole time. When yeah. you do it for years and years on end, I yeah. mean, it's just so destructive. Yeah, like. yeah. But yeah, I, I remember there was this one, this this older writer that I met early on, and, and, and he told me that he'd been off solids for 20 years, you know, and he just, <laughs> he would just drink like two casks every night and then bash away on his laptop. And I remember thinking it was quite cool, and now I just... See so it is a bit sad and stressful. Yeah, and stressful. Yeah. Imagine yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking yeah. on the cask wine. Uh, but it's also important <laughs> to talk about these things, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like to destigmatize yeah. them like mental health addiction. Yeah. You know, because um, there are so many people out there out there suffering. Yeah. Um, and then part of it is because of these mythologies that yeah. we build up in yeah. society and in yeah. and, and in the art scene. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I do see it a little bit nowadays as as my job when I can to sort of dismantle it a little yeah. bit or at least question. For the talent coming through is especially, you know, let them know they don't need a – there's no boxes you need to tick in terms of being a party boy. You can yeah. do that with your mates back home. Yeah. Like- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just get the work done yeah. and then yeah. you can go out. Yeah. <laughs> have have the time of your young life, yeah. yep. you know. It's easy peasy. But don't – yeah. Don't Just you- don't do it while you're riding. <laughs> <laughs> Well, mate, thanks for this. We're um, we're very excited to, to have a have a closer look at these um, at these you know these artworks you've done, and, and of course get through the, the poetry. Yeah, you've uh, you've done it again, and 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 do you think this has sent you on another path uh, moving forward? Do you think it'll be do you think it'll be painting or do you think it'll be writing? No idea, man. I think <laughs> it might be working with glass. Yeah, yeah. I've been yeah. thinking about that recently. Yeah, but I don't know, man. Like these. These things just come up out of nowhere, and I and I decided from now on not to question it, just to f- follow the impulse whenever it pops up. And mm-hmm. I just, I I never know what it's going to be. Mm, yeah. So I just try to keep busy, try to keep putting work out, and then usually when I've got my main objective, some side shoot of a road will come out of nowhere, and I'll just follow that. Yeah, right. Something will. Well, you got to be happy with what you delivered this time around. Killer Nova by Omar Musa. It's available. out uh, November thirtieth. End yeah. of this month. All good bookstores. If you are going to buy it at a shop, make sure it's an independent bookseller. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. that's it. Yeah, don't exactly. go to one that's owned by Woolworths. Don't go to one that's owned by Coles. <laughs> don't buy it online from some giant conglomerate. Yep. Go to your local bookstore. that They've had a caning over this COVID. Yep. So it's good to go and spend your money at a good local bookshop. Yeah. And the uh, on the jacket here, we have uh, poetry that slips between the two worlds, between play and dread, like if Frank Ocean wrote Nostradamus. Oh, man. Terrific. <laughs> on the back, we have, a, I guess you'd say, some sort of a review from the Batuta Advocates, uh, Clancy Overall. It says, pretentious literary navel-gazer. <laughs> this will go well when thrown into the circle jerk of writers' festivals and resin jewelry-led artist panels. That said... It's hard to deny the queen being edge that penetrates these whimsical post-national musings. This man is pretty handy with a lo- linoleum, linoleum cutter too. Congratulations, Omar. Thank you so much. Thanks blessed. for joining us. I feel blessed. <laughs>